Well, welcome, all you wiretappers out there. Good to be back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. As you can tell, I've, I hope my collar's turned up a little bit. I'll maybe play a little golf later on. I certainly have a golf shirt on. It's uh, getting to be summertime. I want to play more golf and more golf. Uh, it's my last addiction, my, my last bad habit, as they say. Anyhow, today we have Greg Stelzinski. I tell you what, Greg, you got to pronounce your name for you. I struggle with names sometimes. Greg, yeah, welcome. Well, yeah. It's pronounced nothing like it looks. It's Stasekel, like it was S T A Y. Okay, Stasekel. And that's, uh, that's Czech. So I learned about you through, I, th I think maybe LinkedIn, but I'm not sure. I just saw that you were a retired FBI agent and you were part of the team that took kind of in, in mob history world that famous picture of the day that I believe it was Jack Toko was, was made boss in the Detroit family, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, that was that was quite a quite a picture you guys got that day. Uh, tell me and tell the, the guys out there a little bit about your career. Were you were you in law enforcement before you went to the FBI, or were you an, uh, uh, an accountant, or a language guy, or a lawyer, or a policeman? <laughs> <laughs> no, I um I had a little bit of exposure to law enforcement, but not not really anything of any significance, but uh, after undergrad, I had wanted to be an FBI agent since I was a kid. And, and after undergrad, uh, I met with an agent in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I was going to school. And he said, uh, hey, if you can get into law school, that's the best way to get into the bureau. Yeah. So uh, that's what I did. I applied to law school, got in. And then uh, just before I uh, finished law school, I put in my application to the bureau. And uh, about six, well, about eight months later, I, uh, I received my appointment. Well, that's pretty rigorous training to, before you even go do that, do, go to Quantico and do the agent training, three years of law school, man. I went to law school. That ain't easy. They don't give that away. No, that's true. <laughs> they actually flunk you out. You know, in undergrad, you, you could kind of glide by and, and keep going. Maybe you flunk a class here and there, but uh, you just come back and try it again. Law school is a little bit different. So anyhow, let's, uh, uh, you know, we were just talking before we got started and sharing some experiences about following people. And, and you tell us a little bit about your career that was Detroit your first office or was that your office of preference? No, my, uh, uh, it, it was my first office. I, I was assigned to Detroit uh, at, and into headquarters. Um, and as it turned out, it was my last office. I, I had office preference. I had preferenced a couple other offices, um, but ultimately uh, I went to the Ann Arbor Resident Agency, which is just a satellite office of Detroit. And we settled in here. Our kids were in school and everything. And uh, so we just decided to stay. So I did. So I spent my 31 and a half year career wow. uh, in, uh, in Michigan. Now you didn't have to move at all and uproot those kids. That's, that's pretty good. A lot of agents do end up having to move. Of course, they, maybe they want to move somewhere else. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I guess uh, what we really want to talk about and uh, the reason that really caught my eye, of course, this is an organized crime mob oriented podcast is uh, you got on the surveillance squad and you're part of a team that took a really famous photo as it turned out in, in retrospect, you probably didn't know exactly what you were taking a photo of for sure that day before you took it. But you, you got on the surveillance squad. So let's talk a little bit about the FBI's dedicated surveillance squad. Well, um, Detroit was actually the, the first office to have a, a dedicated uh, surveillance squad. And that, what that entailed was having agents um, assigned to uh, an offsite location that was a, a cover business, so to speak. And... Um, we were all assigned vehicles that didn't look like police cars and uh, our radios were hidden and uh, uh, we had a, uh, other, other things that made the cars uh, not look like police cars. And then we, uh, we went through a certain amount of training and orientation uh, on the surveillance squad. Back then you couldn't encrypt your radios, at least not, it, it didn't work well. 
So what we had to do is, is memorize code names for the subjects we followed and memorize uh, code names for the major streets and locations uh, so that we could uh, be uh, basically unencrypted on the radio because it, even though we were operating at pretty high frequencies, it was possible to, uh, to intercept our, our communications. So you had uh, uh, dedicated slick cars, as we call them. Folks, if you don't know what a, you hear somebody refer to as a slick car, there's, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, cops, if cops started following me, I'd know it because, you know, they all drive those uh, Victorias, uh, Crown Vicks. Oh, they, yeah, the Crown Vic. Yeah. <laughs> the Crown Vic, or back then, the, the Plymouth Fury or whatever it was, a four-door Plymouth Fury with an antenna on it. But I always laugh because, you know, we had, we used to get used rental cars. We had the rental cars companies company started selling their used cars and we just buy used rental cars. You didn't look like any different than anybody else. Did you guys get yours the same way? No, we, uh, uh, we would acquire them and we had a special acquisition. Um, you would, you know, of course the Bureau would buy, you know, whole fleets of cars, yeah. but, but we had a special acquisition um, where they, uh, and a, person that was uh, would purchase the cars and we'd buy ones you know obviously two doors sportier looking cars um uh and so uh that's and we, we got them new uh and of course we put a lot of miles on them while we had them but uh so that's that's how we have got our vehicles we also had you know surveillance vans so that we you know in case we wanted to take uh, photos and things and try yeah. to get in closer stuff like that so you had to hide the radios. You had to have a radio, but you had to hide the radio. And and uh, I believe you, you mentioned about the uh, the light switches. Tell us about that. How, how did you trick those cars out? And, and well, we're not I, giving away any secrets, I don't think, because everything's so different today that, you know, now I know everybody knows this. They just throw a GPS tracker on there and send it the, on the office and say, oh, he went here, went here, went there. Let's go see where he is now. Yeah, well, we would do things, uh, uh, you know, some of the things uh, are probably not known now. Like I said, we couldn't encrypt the radios, but we could, uh, we had the ability with a toggle switches to turn off, you know, our left or right headlight, things like that. So that uh, vehicles, uh, especially if you follow them at night, they looked in the rear view mirror, the, the light configuration would look different. Um, we would try to switch off cars anyway, but uh, that was helpful if you were involved in a surveillance and you didn't want people to know you were behind them. Yeah, it's a constant battle on a surveillance and, and you can never have enough people. What about air support? Did you have a, a dedicated pilot and in, in a plane uh, that the Bureau had there in the city? We did. Uh, that became, and, and that has become, I think, more more part of the uh, protocol now than it was when, when I was working. We had, uh, the plane wasn't up all the time. And of course that was, there was weather factors involved there too. Yeah. But, uh, and we did have uh, a couple pilots, uh, bureau pilots that would fly uh, fixed wing aircraft. We never used helicopters. Um, and um, like I say, that's more prevalent now than it was when I was in, but when we were doing, uh, uh, special surveillances. And if we had a major crime type of thing, like a kidnapping or something like that, then of course the plane would go up so that we could surveil the, the uh, drop sites and things like that. Yeah. It, it's kind of amazing. It seemed like a fixed wing plane would, would be difficult, but once that pilot locks on somebody, if they're you know, they, and they can stay high enough up, they can see a lot. They, they can see so far and, and it's just, it's amazing what a pilot could do. You know, we, we had some of our Bob guys start going down into the airport. The airport's close to, to downtown <laughs> and they drive into the, the airport and back out again real quick on the other side because they knew the plane couldn't follow them down into there at the spur of a moment. So <laughs> they knew about it. I remember one guy standing out beside his car just looking. And if he saw a plane making a big, lazy circle, he, he knew. <laughs> Yeah, it uh, the guys that are surveillance wise, it's difficult sometimes. Yeah, to, uh, to do any type of surveillance, certainly for any length of time. So. Yeah, 
you're really the best bet. And I know you learned this is you get start getting patterns on them and you don't really try to follow them exactly everywhere. You just got to know the general direction they're going. And then you stick or hang around where they might show up a couple of three different places. And then you'll pick them back up again pretty quick. It, it's really hard to stay locked down on somebody all the time. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. And, and uh, sometimes you'd send people ahead and, and, uh, or if you had information where they were planning on going, you would uh, you'd be able to do that. Try to try to stay with them on the surveillance, but loose, and then have people waiting for them on the other end. Yeah, remember any of the code names for the uh, kind of your main characters? Like here, we had uh, uh, Corky Savella was Kodak, and uh, they were all some kind of Joe Ragusa was rum, and Tuffy was tequila. We all there was always some alcoholic beverage that had the same. Uh, uh, first letter of something to do with your subject's name did you did you do something like that well we had yeah we had we had nicknames for the various ones we had one uh, a guy by the name of palazzola which was uh, uh I'm, I'm guessing it was close to the word butterflies uh, in uh, in italian so uh. they, we called him the butterfly and there was <laughs> another uh uh well vito jackalone had a uh, had an artificial leg and uh so he had a pronounced limp and uh, we called him the pirate. Uh, so, <laughs> so there were those. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like what they do. You get on a wiretap and, and they have all these different names, you know, crazy and newspaper and channel and, and you yeah. got to figure out, you know, that, and that name has some meaning usually <laughs> some, some thing, some descriptor of that person. But you have to know background to figure out what it is. So there's one particular day. Uh, talk, let's talk about that day. It was in Detroit. Uh, the Detroit upper echelon of the Detroit crime family were starting to meet up. Can you describe that day to us? Yeah, and, and we had no idea that, that, that there was a meeting planned that day. We went up uh, and we had sites where we would generally go on different days, following different people and stuff. And sometimes we'd have some information about a meeting. Other times we would just follow them and see, see what would happen. On this particular day, we set up on uh, Rafael Quasarano and his, uh, his code name was, well, it wasn't his code name, his family name within the, the mob was, was Jimmy Q. And we set up on, uh, on, Quasarano's, he had a barber, a barber supply store up in one of the northeast suburbs, just north of Detroit. So we set up on that and uh, we saw a vehicle pull in uh, a Cadillac and Jack Toco got out. Well, uh, Jack was a high up and of course Quasarano was too. Quasarano was a capo and uh, so Jack Toco walked into the barber supply place and we were sitting out there and a little while later, a guy by the name of Frank Bomarito, who was a, a made guy, but he wasn't in the hierarchy. He pulled in driving a van and um, uh, parked in the lot, went inside. A few minutes later, Bomarito walked out of the, uh, the supply store and hopped in Jack Toko's Cadillac and took off. Uh, so we thought that was odd. We were debating whether to, uh, to follow Bomarito but then we saw uh, Jack Toco, Quasarano, and a couple of the other uh, guys um, come out. I think one of them was Zarelli. I can't remember who all were there. But at any rate, they came out of the, uh, uh, the barber supply place and jumped in this van that Bomarito had, uh, had parked there. And they took off and started driving west. Well, we had no question where we were going to go now. So we followed, followed that van. There was another crew out. We had two crews out that day. Crews generally run about four or five agents and, and each of them in an individual car. And there was another crew on, uh, I believe it was uh, Vito Giacalone. And um, uh, I could hear them on the radio as well. And they were moving. And uh, after a little while, it became clear that we were heading in the same general direction. We were heading out west of Detroit Detroit's in, <clears throat> excuse me, Detroit's in Wayne County, and um, 
they were heading west and crossed into Washtenaw County, which is just west of, of Wayne County. And uh, uh, they ended up going to a place uh, that was the Timberland Game Ranch. It was a, uh, a game farm where you could pay on animals, some of them exotic, I guess, and uh, private property. Uh, and they, uh, the van pulled in there. The other crew had brought uh, Jack alone and a couple other guys. They pulled in there. We found a spot along the road. It was on North Territorial Road, uh, north of Chelsea, Michigan. And uh, we found a spot on the road where you could, we could watch the front gate. And we saw eight or nine, uh, you know, Lincoln Continentals and, and Cadillacs pull into this game branch. And so we're kind of standing around trying to figure out what's going on. And, uh, uh, but, you know, it's private property. We obviously can't drive in. Um, so I decided, well, you know, this is, this appears to be too big a thing. I was the, uh, I was heading up one of the crews. So I got together with the other crew and, I said, you know, I'm going to go in there and see what I can see. And uh, another guy, a guy by the name of Keith Cordes, um, said to me, well, if you're going in, I'm going in with you. And I said, okay. So we got another agent, a guy by the name of Dave Smart. Dave put us in his car. We drove down to the west end of the property where this Timberland Game Ranch was and uh, uh, went uh, north on Hankard Road a little ways, got out climbed over this big fence and just started walking through the woods back towards where uh, the game ranch was. And uh, as we got in, the uh, woods were pretty thick. And as we got in close, we could, we could hear people talking, but we really couldn't see much and we couldn't hear what they were saying. We could, there was obviously a, a fairly large group. Um, so we're walking up and I'm trying, I'm looking around and then I see this open area, sort of a swath of land um, that was open. They had been cleared. And I, I, we got up to one end of it and I realized it was an archery range and there was a target there. And it was about, um, I'm guessing uh, 50 to 60 yards from where they were all meeting, where there were some buildings and stuff. Um, so Keith Cordes and I got behind the target. I remember Keith saying to me, you know, is this a very good idea getting behind the target? And I said, well, hopefully these guys aren't into archery. So I, uh, I had taken my, uh, my uh, 300 millimeter lens and my uh, Nikon uh, SLR camera. And uh, so I rested the 300 millimeter lens on top of the target and took a couple, three pictures, one of which turned out pretty well uh, under the circumstances. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, by that time, of course, you know, everybody uh, that was involved in work and organized crime investigations had heard about, about this fact that these guys were all meeting there. And uh, we had put the plane up and we've got our, uh, our HTs are handy talkie with us and, and uh, the plane's calling us saying, hey, uh, it looks like they're getting ready to release some dogs or something. And so uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what that was all about. We could hear, we could hear dogs barking and I, I don't know if, to this day, don't know for sure what that was all about, but we decided it might be a good time to get out of there. So took off and got out uh, and got picked uh, where we had been dropped off afterwards uh, after we got out uh, as the this meeting it was sort of it looked like a, uh, a giant picnic uh, after it started to break up we had the state police stop some of the vehicles as they left and we had source information too and uh, we determined that this was uh, a meeting that had been called to basically uh, celebrate the uh, ascension of Jack Toko, Giacomo Toko, to the head of the Detroit family of the Cosa Nostra. And everybody that was anybody in the Detroit family, at least the ones that weren't in jail, 
uh, were at this this meeting. And uh, I've since then I've talked to a couple of uh, mafia historians, and they told me, to the best of their knowledge, nobody has ever seen uh, that happen. Be yeah. be uh, visually see uh, that type of meeting, and uh, to have a picture of it is yeah. Uh, so it, it was very fortuitous, and the, uh, that was in the summer of 1979. And in 1998, we tried the hierarchy of the Detroit family on a RICO charge, racketeer influence, corrupt organization charge. We indicted Jack Tilko uh, and all of the hierarchy of the family, and they were all convicted under the RICO statute. And for the first time, that, that photo became public information mm -hmm. uh, and it was introduced into evidence. I testified as to how I got the photo. And in the photo is Vito Giacalone standing on one side of Jack Tilko and on the other side is Anthony Corrado. Both Vito and Anthony Corrado were capos in the family. Vito Giacalone, interestingly, about a week or so before the, uh, the trial began, the RICO trial began, he uh, went before a, a federal judge and pled guilty. And in his guilty plea, he admitted to the federal judge that there was a Detroit family of the Co La Cosa Nostra. Mm -hmm. And again, nobody had ever admitted that. I mean, everybody knew it, but nobody had ever admitted it, especially in open court, and said that he was a member of it. So when we got to trial and I introduced that photo, of course, it came out that one of the people in that picture was Vito Jackalone, who had already pled guilty and admitted he was a member of the Detroit family. So that picture became very important. Yeah. Uh, it's always nice to have visual aids when you're taking <laughs> case to the jury. So it was uh, it was fortuitous. I mean, we had no idea what we what we were in for or what what would happen, but it worked out really well. <laughs> yeah. The moral of the story is. Uh... You just got to go out there and be out there every day. And, and you sit there sometimes and think, what am I doing? You know, there's nothing, they're not doing anything. You just sit there. And then all of a sudden, you know, if you weren't there, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to help with that prosecution because to do a RICO case, as you know, you got to really provide a lot of evidence to show this is an organization and, and, and a lot of different little bits of, you can have a storyteller saying, this is an organization, this is who is who, but then to show those pictures of them together, uh, it's really hard for them to deny in the end that, that they are well, part of an organization. As you say, you present, you present, in this case, we're presenting information and, and evidence that, well, I took that photo in 1979, the trials in 1998, we're talking almost 20 years. Yeah. Uh, and in between, there's tons of investigation that went into that case. And, and like I say, we were able to convict uh, all of the hierarchy of uh, under the RICO statute. So, Yeah, the Bureau kind of worked itself out of a job with the Italian Mafia. <laughs> Costa Nostra, it seems to be. Yeah, like it's, <laughs> it's, it's not what it used to be, that's for sure. It does still exist, but, yeah, uh, but... not to the level it did. No. And the Detroit family was was uh, had been very successful. They uh, they started up. They really became uh, uh, successful during Prohibition because Detroit is located right across the Detroit River mm -hmm. from Windsor, Canada. And during Prohibition, obviously, Windsor, Canada is where uh, you know Windsor, the Windsor Distillery is right there, and. Uh, so a lot of booze came across yeah. the Detroit River during Prohibition, and, and the Detroit family uh, controlled that. Some of it was uh, uh, Joseph Kennedy supposedly brought some, uh, a lot of Irish whiskey across to, that way. But at any rate, so the Detroit family was actually had a seat on the commission with the five New York families, mm -hmm. and uh, they were that successful. I think Chicago did too, but... Uh, they were one of the few one, uh, families outside of right. New York that actually had a seat at the table. Yeah. For example, Kansas City didn't. Uh, I think maybe New Orleans, uh, Tampa, Detroit, and Chicago were the only ones outside of the immediate New York vicinity at, at one time. I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but 
Uh, so, you know, speaking of, and Detroit also moved on and, and they were the people that were the, the main people that dealt with Hoffa and the Teamsters kind of got that all rolling too. It seems to me like, did that's, you end up working true. on the well, Hoffa thing? Uh, I got to Detroit in the summer of 1975 uh, in, at the end of June, at the end of July, Hoffa was abducted. Okay. And so uh, I was in, well, we were all, everybody in Detroit, it was all hands on deck. And I was involved in that investigation early on. And then it, it was sort of, you know, part of my life during the entire time I was in Detroit, because we were, you know, uh, initially it was very busy working the case, but at some point, you know, there wasn't much going on, but we were constantly checking out leads and things. Yeah. Uh, you know, we determined, uh, the, relationship between the Detroit family, which was the main liaison, by the way, Vito Giacalone and uh, his brother, Anthony Giacalone. So it was Tony Jack and Billy Jack met with Hoffa uh, about 10 days before he disappeared. And Hoffa thought that he was meeting uh, Vito and Tony Giacalone the day he disappeared. He had, he had told people I'm meeting them today. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, Tony Jack alone had a uh, had an alibi, and we were never able to prove that Vito uh, met with uh, with Hoffa. But uh, obviously, uh, that's what Hoffa thought, and and uh, we uh, we assume that they played an integral part in setting him up to be murdered. Yeah, he was. Uh, now, correct me if I'm wrong. He was creating some problems, wanting to come back in and get involved with the Teamsters again and the mob, especially Chicago and Kansas City and everybody else that had uh, uh, casino uh, loans through them, through the pension fund, they did not want Hoffa back in because he was going to change everything up. They had a sweet deal going with Ben Simmons and wasn't Hoffa trying to move back in? He was trying to get back in. Now Hoffa played ball with the mob, but Hoffa was his own man. And, right. And, uh, he, uh, uh, he was hard to control and the mob had put Fitzsimmons, well, actually uh, Hoffa had picked Fitzsimmons to be his vice president. And then Fitzsimmons, while Hoffa was in jail, uh, became the president in his own right. Uh, and Fitzsimmons didn't want to step down and the mob didn't, uh, were afraid that they couldn't control Hoffa. Hoffa started making threats that he was going to, uh, uh, spill the beans regarding the relationship with the uh, Teamsters Pension Fund and the, and the mob. So that was the reason he was killed. Now, um, about a week before Hoffa was abducted, uh, Fitzsimmons and his son uh, were at uh, uh, Nemo's Bar in Detroit. It's an Irish bar near the old Tiger Stadium. And it's not too far from the Teamsters local there, which is was the uh, sort of the home of both uh, uh, Hoffa and Fitzsimmons. So Fitzsimmons is, is Frank Fitzsimmons and his son Richard were at Nemo's uh, inside and uh, their car blew up. Uh, mm. And it was always supposed that that was meant as a warning from Hoffa mm. that he wanted to take control. And so it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that Hoffa disappeared uh, about a week later. Yeah, because uh, I w would you speculate that uh, there was a lot of people, like I said, in organized crime that were dipping into this Teamsters pension fund and getting the kickbacks after they'd influenced the loans. Uh, but it would be Detroit's business. It would be Detroit family's responsibility to handle Hoffa. And if there was something that needed to be done with Hoffa, they would be the ones responsible, not Kansas City or Cleveland or Chicago or, or certainly not New Jersey. Tony Pro hated him and all that, but it would be Detroit's job because he was their guy. Is that uh, in that that's, world? That's the way it worked. The uh, Detroit family was the, uh, uh, the liaison, the direct liaison between uh, Hoffa and, uh, and the mob. And, uh, and it was uh, actually uh, Tony Giacalone, Anthony Giacalone, who uh, was the principal as far as that relationship. And his brother Vito was, was generally involved as well. 
they were both capos in the family. So uh, uh, anything that uh, was going to happen with Hoffa would, uh, would have been coordinated through the Detroit family. Interesting. So pure speculation here, you know, there's a lot of controversy about this. Where's Hoffa's body? <laughs> what's, your, what's your take on that? Well, it's, it's not just my take. I think the people that were involved, uh, the two agents that originally were case agents on the Hoffa case were uh, uh, Jim Esposito and uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the other agent uh, was uh, Garrity. Uh, and uh, at any rate, uh, uh, sort of the opinion of those agents and the other agents that have been involved in this case over a long period of time believe that they destroyed his body. They killed him and destroyed his body as quickly as possible. Yeah. Because these guys, you know, mob guys aren't stupid. And they knew without a body uh, that it would be, as long as nobody said anything, uh, it would be nearly impossible to make a case. Uh, for the murder of, of Hoffa. And uh, obviously that's true. We don't have the body and, and we never made a case. Now we did prosecute most of the people that were involved with that, but uh, that we think were involved um, and uh, successfully prosecuted them, but nobody's ever been prosecuted obviously for the murder of Hoffa. And so we think that's, uh, that's most probably what happened now. Uh, some other people will, will give you other answers, tell you yeah. they dropped him off to New Jersey and stuff. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but, uh, and then, you know, they say he was buried under the Rensen in Detroit. Uh, that also doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, yeah. You don't do things like that if you're trying to hide a body. So. <laughs> no, that's one thing that mob guys know is you don't want to be caught with evidence from the scene of a murder. That's why they drop off the gun. As soon as they get away, that gun is gone. Anything from that scene. So if you got to hide a body, I can't imagine you would carry that body very far. You talk about evidence if you were involved in a murder. <laughs> well, and I've, I've heard some people speculate that, um, that, uh, you know, the, the mob in the long run, you know, in hindsight, might have been better off just to dump his body in the street. <laughs> yeah, and it less heat. <laughs> well, and it, 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 uh, it might have, you know, you wouldn't have all the speculation and yeah. everything that you still have because, you know, everybody talks about, and it's always the first per, uh, question people ask me when I'm talking about. The <laughs> yeah, cases. I couldn't so, help it. <laughs> <laughs> so what they, what they do with him? Yeah. I mean, where did he yeah. go? A national Geographic Channel did a whole show on uh, on all the different theories about what happened to Hoffa and his body. There's some pretty wild theories out there, I'll tell you right now, Greg. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, <laughs> and, and you know there were even people that that game farm where I took the photo. There were some people that speculated. Well, maybe they took him out and buried him there because <laughs> yeah. a couple mob guys owned that property, yeah. so they figured. Well, and you know we've obviously over the years the bureau has had to make some digs and stuff because. You know, if we don't, then people are going to say we're not not looking. But I don't yeah. think we, uh, at least not very many people, ever expected us to actually yeah. find the body. Interesting. So is there, is there any other case that sticks out in your mind on uh, uh, your surveillance squad? Any kidnappings? Have any real successes? Save anybody or anything Well, like you know, that? we uh, uh, there were a number of kidnappings uh, in Detroit, and uh, several of which I was involved with when I was on the surveillance squad, one in particular before I was on the surveillance squad, but uh, you know, the surveillance squad was particularly helpful in those kind of situations because you had the ability to, to, uh, to surveil the drop site, surveil the victims and, and, and the off chance that you know, the, uh, the kidnappers would make contact with them and everything. So, and uh, uh, by and large, we were, we were very successful with that. And, uh, and uh, one, in, one in particular, when I first got to Detroit, was uh, Robert Stemple's son was kidnapped. And uh, he, uh, uh, Robert Stemple was high up in General Motors, later became the CEO of General yeah. Motors. But his son was kidnapped, his teenage son was kidnapped. And uh, he was put in the trunk of a car and kept there for 
three or four days. Ultimately, the ransom was paid and it was a really st stormy, rainy night. So we couldn't get the plane up to surveil the site. And uh, of course, you, the first rule in a kidnapping is you want to get the, the victim back alive. Uh, so nobody wanted to burn the, the drop site. So the, the, guy, the bad guys managed to get away with the money that night, but uh, they, they had paid a couple guys some money to, to take them to the drop site. And the guys that they paid, uh, uh, they gave them about a thousand bucks, I guess. And they started spending the money uh, <laughs> in the vicinity of the drop site. And of course the money was all marked and everything. And uh, that's how we broke the case. So, and I was involved in the arrest of one of the guys and, and got a confession and a signed statement from him. So, that was uh, uh, that was one of the high points of my early career. So. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, take those little successes where you can get them, don't you? In that world, it's just it's you know everybody's constantly trying to evade you, and uh, it, 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 it's a, a tough job to be successful. All right, Greg Stelsko. 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 Greg Stelsko. FBI. There you case, go. Case files. <laughs> Michigan. Yeah, I got one too. <laughs> so folks, uh, you might want to get this book. I've read through it and, and it's got a lot of interesting, different little tidbits in it besides the ones we've talked about, all these different cases. Uh, uh, you got uh, Unmasking the Joker. You got, I uh, see, uh, uh, the uh, the Unabomber. That, that You had some Detroit agents involved in that initial identification of the Unabomber, huh? Yeah, well, that's because uh, Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, went to graduate school at the University of Michigan. Oh, that's right. That's right. And uh, so consequently, when uh, early on, when we were had the manifesto and some of the things that he had written to his brother, we at that point, uh, it had not been disclosed to us uh, that uh, that the Unabomber was Ted Kaczynski. So I got a call from a supervisor out in San Francisco working on the, uh, the task force. And we had talked before on some other leads and because uh, we had had one of the bombings at the university as well. Uh, but he, uh, he called me and he said, you know, we've got a few bits and pieces of information from this. And, and uh, we we're wondering if you could go to the university and figure out who this guy is based on this information. So they knew he had gone to Harvard. They knew he had grown up in the Chicago area. They knew about how old he was and some things like that. So uh, I couldn't go to the university without, you know, they wouldn't give me anything at that point without a subpoena. And, uh, you know, we didn't have uh, the ability to do that. Plus, we didn't want anybody to know we were, where we were on the case. So um, uh, I went to a friend that worked on the Department of Public Safety for the university, the university police department. And he came up with a list of names that fit some of the, but the only one that really fit everything was uh, Ted Kaczynski. So when I called the supervisor back, he said to me, he said, well, Greg, right now you and I are the only two people in the world that, <laughs> that know that Ted Kaczynski's the Unabomber. So uh, I think that would probably also include David Kaczynski, which was Ted's brother, yeah. who about I think it was about two days later, actually uh, verified that that's mm -hmm. in fact who it was too. Interesting. So. Well, that was a heck of a case. I've, I've heard podcasts on that and uh, there's a movie out there on a TV deal that was pretty well done about that. And <clears throat> that agent that, uh, that uh, can't remember his name, but he convinced him to uh, publish that uh, writing because the writing style was so unique. <clears throat> Yeah, and, uh, and, and really, uh, uh, Louis Free, the director at the time, and Janet Reno, uh, the, ta the, P the, the leadership of the task force said, you know, we, we should, uh, there was some misgivings about doing it, publishing the manifesto, but uh, Louis Free and Janet uh, Reno went to the editors of the Washington Post and the uh, New York Times and talked them into and putting it in there and I, I can't remember it's like 30,000 words which, yeah it was a lot you know, is, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know that's uh, 
that's a lot of newsprint and yeah. uh, very expensive. But the New York Times and the Washington Post agreed to do it. And uh, so they did. And it ultimately broke the case. Yeah, so. it did. That was, and, and on any case like that, as you know, is it's a whole lot of different people. Maybe one guy has a little bit of luck more than the other, but it's a whole lot. Of, it's a big team effort to break any kind of those bigger cases, especially everybody's got to do their part. That's true. All right, Greg. Well, thanks a lot for coming on and uh, I appreciate it. Uh, good luck. And folks, uh, don't forget the FBI case files, Michigan at, at Amazon. And I'm sure it's uh, yeah. It, and Barnes and Noble has it. Uh, and some local bookstores, I guess, I, I know they do in Michigan, but uh, yeah. you know, it's really, uh, I was very fortunate to be involved in a lot of high profile cases. Yeah. And it was, as I emphasize in the book, uh, it was all a team effort. <laughs> I just happened to be lucky enough to be involved. <laughs> yeah, so. that's how it works. Greg, thanks a lot. Oh, you're welcome, Gary. Okay, bye. Bye. Well, folks, that was that was most interesting. I, I like that guy. Uh, he and I uh, had a, our paths kind of, uh, I did a lot of the things that he did. We had a car like that, that you could shut off the one headlight or the other, uh, or one tail light or the other light, other tail light. Uh, so it's uh, hide the radios in the uh, glove box and, and part of the radio would be in the trunk and, and run the wires through there. I even, I even had one of our cars, I, a, we had take home cars. Uh, it was like a, I want to say like a 76 uh, Oldsmobile Cutlass or Pontiac, uh, that mid-level car. I parked it out in front of my house. I couldn't get it up in the driveway that night for some reason. And then I was, I should have gone back out and got it off the street, but I didn't. Some kids stole it. And I had some kind of a, a valuable in, in a way in the right circles. It was a list of people that had been picked up off of a mob pen register here in the city. And my briefcase that I was supposed to take back to the analyst. I'd been by the FBI's office that afternoon and then got distracted on the way home and had to go to another scene where uh, people were serving a search warrant and, and so I just drove on home and it, uh, I guess my wife's car was in the driveway and I usually parked on the other side of it. And I just didn't feel like messing with it. I come out in the morning and, and the car's gone. So we find it. And luckily for us, we find it over where a lot of the uh, kids that steal cars all the time dump their cars. They, don't, they, they steal them on the west side and drive them back to the east side and dump them in their neighborhood. So we found the car over there, but the briefcase was gone. Was, this kind of gets into a heck of a story, but we start doing an area canvas and, and then I got some detectives from the station to help. And, and uh, we left, you know, we weren't finding anything. We recovered the car. We don't know where the briefcase is or what's happened to the uh, list of uh, people on that pin register. And bureau's freaking and my boss is freaking and I'm freaking. I felt so bad because it was just laziness. I should have gone out and backed her car out of the driveway, put my car in, but I didn't. So the detective calls me, he said, I got a tip from a neighbor. I go back over and he tells me and, and it seems that this kid that the one that stole it and she saw him drop it off and he lived in this particular house and we know and there oh the radio was gone he took the guts of the radio the sending unit and everything out of the trunk and the head of it out of the glove box and all the wiring and and we found out there was a drug house about a block away and he was a, a crackhead so went up to the drug house Served a search warrant, got my, my friend over at Street Narcotics to serve a search warrant on the drug house. Went in there and, and nothing. We couldn't find the radio. We didn't find anything. But we did get somebody to admit that, yeah, he had been trying to sell his radio. So then we got a search warrant on his house. We go down and, and it's his parents' house. And, and they, you know, it was a battle with them. But we served the warrant and they didn't have a choice. Uh, we found the briefcase. And every, most of the papers were in it, but some of the papers were gone and the list of phone numbers were gone. Like, oh my God, we get this kid in, he won't talk, he won't say anything. And I don't remember, I guess we charged him with auto theft, I can't remember now. I just know I was still freaking out. So we just held our breath and for the next month or two and that, that pen register that was up and that investigation was on these two guys, uh, Joe Mike Kalia, 
uh, and uh, 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 James Bruton, and, and they were running a kind of a big time drug thing actually, and and they were mob associates, and that's it. That whole investigation just seemed to roll right along. They didn't change up in any way. So apparently those papers just got thrown away and, and we never knew it, but I had to sweat that one out, those uh, surveillance cars. So uh, take that as a, a lesson, guys. Do not leave anything like that in your car if you're going to leave it on the street or anywhere it could be stolen. Uh, anyhow, so thanks a lot for listening and uh, I, I appreciate all you guys out there. You're kind comments on uh, my YouTube channel or the reviews on uh, Apple podcast. It's a, uh, it's an ongoing process. As a lot of you know that I'm, I'm putting extra stuff up on YouTube, some little shorter stories up on YouTube. And I'm also using the audio from them. I'm putting up a little extra material right now. Um, I don't know. I just feel like doing it. I'm not doing anything else. It's summertime. I'm kind of ahead. I'm playing a little more golf. But I, I really like to get this content out because I know people, there's there a certain group of people out there that like my stuff and like the stories that I find and a lot of these others and, and former mob guys and, and people like that, former agents. So I'm just going to keep doing it. Uh, don't forget, watch out for motorcycles and watch out for PTSD. And if you've been in the service, if you think you've got PTSD, you're having any kind of problems, especially problems with drugs or alcohol or problems being arrested, uh, violence, uh, anger problems, uh, go to the VA and, and get that hotline number and call that hotline and get some help. There's help out there for you. Thanks a lot, folks. Bye.